Hi everybody, I am Brother Brandon, and today I want to talk to you about the Reformation. I suppose the first question I should address is, what is the Reformation? Well, put simply, the Reformation was a movement in the 1500s that called the church to reform from corruption and to correct theology being taught. Now, perhaps you're thinking, that was 500 years ago. How can that still be relevant today? The Reformation is important because it shows us the power of the gospel in the lives of ordinary people. While there are many intricate points and intertwining issues that the Reformation addressed, the essence to the Reformation is about salvation. How are we saved? What is the gospel? This is a question that we should continue to ask ourselves, that each generation of Christians should ask themselves. This is a pretty serious question, and a very important question to get right. Consider scripture's warning in the book of Galatians, where it states, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, and so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Scripture says that those who distort the gospel, who preach a false gospel, should be accursed. This is strong language and a strong warning. Therefore, preaching the correct gospel is important. The reformers felt it was worth fighting for and worth dying for to the extent that many were put to death for preaching the true gospel. The main teachings of the reformers could be summarized in five major points. Historical theologians refer to these points as the five solas. So what are the five solas? sola gratia, by grace alone, sola fide, through faith alone, solus Christus, in Christ alone, sola scriptura, according to scripture alone, soli dio gloria, for the glory of God alone. We will explore these points using them as a framework as we study the Reformation. Now during our study, we're mainly going to examine the life and work of Martin Luther, who led the world in this Reformation. But before we do so, I would like to preface with two main points. First, we are not to idolize Luther. He was just a man that God happened to use. Now he did great things, and anyone who calls themselves Protestant is really standing on the shoulders of Luther's work, whether they know it or not. That being said, Luther was not perfect, and his theology is not perfect. I personally don't agree with everything Luther did. I don't agree with all of his teachings. I don't agree with everything he said. But what he got right is the gospel. And it is largely due to his work and effort that recovered the gospel teachings. So I'm not going to focus on his errors or points where I don't agree with his teachings. That is not to hide his errors, that is just simply not the point of this video. There is much that we can learn from his work and his life as he led the Reformation. Second, while Luther is generally the one who gets most of the credit and focus during any study on the Reformation, it is important to remember that Luther was not alone. There were some who came before Luther, such as the English theologian John Wycliffe, who had lived from 1328 to 1384, dying about a hundred years before Luther was born. Wycliffe taught that scripture should have authority over the church, and that it should be read by everyone, not just the clergy. Wycliffe went as far as to translate the Bible from the standard Latin into English. At this time, the only authorized version of the Bible was Jerome's Latin translation, which he translated around the year 382 AD. Wycliffe died of a stroke in 1384, 
and about 30 years after his death, Wycliffe was deemed a heretic of the church for his teachings and for his translation, and his books were burned for it. Another key person before Luther was a Czech theologian named John Huss, who was highly influenced by Wycliffe's works, and also taught that scripture should have authority over the church, that the Bible should be in the language of the people, not just in the Latin. In addition to these teachings, he also taught against the corruption in the church and the selling of indulgences. This was an issue that Luther himself would also go on to teach against. Due to these teachings, John Huss was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake in 1415, about 70 years before Luther was born. In addition to those who came before Luther, there were others who worked to reform the church during and after Luther's time, such as Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale, John Calvin, and John Knox. I point this out simply to clarify that it was not all Luther. God used many men to recover the gospel. That being said, we're going to focus our study on Martin Luther because simply put, he was the key player. He was the one that really started the movement in a way that caused it to spread around Europe. So that should bring us to a question then. Who was Martin Luther? Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483 in Eisleben, Germany. To give some context to when Luther was born, the printing press was invented in 1436, about 50 years before Luther was born, which dramatically changed the way people were able to publish and distribute writings in a way that the world just had not seen a tool that Luther would take advantage of like no one else before him. Another significant event in world history within Luther's time was Christopher Columbus sailing and discovering the New World in 1492. Luther would have been about eight, almost nine when this happened. Luther's parents were not particularly wealthy, but his father was able to move up in status and eventually owned a copper mine. He wanted the best for his son and made sure that Luther had a good education. In 1501, Luther went to the University of Erfurt, where he studied law and planned to become a lawyer. Then in the summer of 1505, something happened that would change Luther's life. While traveling back to school from visiting home, he was traveling from Eisleben to Erfurt, and suddenly Luther was caught in a terrible lightning storm where a lightning bolt hit a nearby tree. In his anguish and fear, he called out, Help me, St. Anne. I will become a monk. Now, this may seem to be a bit odd to us, praying to St. Anne. However, it was, and to a point still is, a common practice in the Catholic Church to appeal to a saint. St. Anne in particular was the patron saint of minors, so Luther was appealing to the patron saint of his father. Luther survived the storm, and true to his word, and to his father's disappointment, Luther gave up law school, and instead entered the Erfurt Monastery, joining the Augustinian monastic order. In Luther's first five years, we begin to encounter the first sola, that is sola deo gloria, the glory of God alone. Well, kind of. After two years, in 1507, Luther completes the ordination to become a priest and performs his first mass. This was a big deal, and his parents came to attend the occasion. Luther was doing everything flawlessly, but when it came for him to say the words of the Eucharist, he couldn't finish the ritual. He found himself asking, who is I to hold the blood of Jesus? Luther took the holiness of God serious. Being an educated man and one who studied law, he took the law of God serious. He took sin serious and knew that he was full of sin. He knew that not even a minute in his life could he love God with all his heart, all his mind, all his strength, and all his soul. He knew that he deserved the wrath of the righteous God. Luther struggled terrible depression 
knowing that he could not live up to God's standard. He felt tortured in knowing that it was impossible. He would spend hours in confession each day, to the point that the priest would tell him to only come when he had committed a serious sin. But Luther recognized that every sin was deserving of death, and therefore every sin needed to be forgiven. Therefore he would spend hours to confess every sin that he could think of. But then he would leave, unsure if he remembered every one of his sins. In addition to lengthy daily confessions, Luther tried every kind of work of self-deprivation, but knew that it was not enough to atone for sin. He began to grow angry with God for being in the impossible situation of being mandated to be holy as God is holy, knowing that it was impossible to fulfill the command and therefore doomed. During this time, Luther thought of Jesus as only as a righteous judge. And one day someone asked Luther if he loved God, and Luther, in his despair, answered, Love God? Sometimes I hate him. Luther was a man who rightly understood the glory of God and took the glory of God serious. He took his sin serious and took the law of God serious. But he did not know the gospel. I think that this can serve as a good lesson to each of us. For the law is meant to convict, but it is not meant to save. Only Jesus can save. But Luther did not know a saving Jesus. He only knew of Jesus as a righteous judge. Another major moment in Luther's life happens in the year 1510, where Luther is sent to Rome to represent the Erfurt Monastery for a church meeting. And Luther was excited to go. He felt that the answers to his burden and the weight of sin could be removed in Rome, the holy city. For one, embarking on a pilgrimage to Rome was considered a work earning great amount of merit. In order to understand why Luther was excited to go to Rome, we need to understand a bit of Catholic theology, specifically the Sacrament of Penance. Now, as we explore this sacrament, I want to warn you up front, it, it gets a little noodly. That is, the doctrine is somewhat complicated, and I'm going to do my best to keep it simple and may risk the error of being maybe overly simplistic. But in Catholic theology, then and now, penance is the second plank of salvation after the shipwreck which is the loss of grace. The idea, according to Catholic theology, is that some sins can make you lose the grace of God and therefore need to re-earn it through the sacrament of penance. It is something that must be done to receive forgiveness of sins and to earn lost merit from those sins. Again, according to Catholic theology, those who die without enough merit, or owing more merit than they had in their death, go to purgatory, to work until their debt is complete. Now, penance consists of four parts. The first part is contrition, that is, to have actual guilt for your sins. Not just sorry that you were caught, not just sorry that you're in trouble, but actual guilt of the sin, actual guilt that you defied God. The next part of penance is confession, where you then confess your sins to a priest, motivated out of the true guilt. The third part is absolution, where the priest would then assure that the person's sins was forgiven in Christ, and then would tell the person to do a work of satisfaction to gain merit to make the absolution complete. Which brings us to the fourth part of penance, which is works of satisfaction. Works of satisfaction were things to gain merit. As I said, it was things to make that forgiveness complete. And it would be things like prayers, such as doing so many Hail Marys or so many Our, Our Fathers, Sometimes it would be to do some kind of service for the church. Sometimes it would be giving of alms, like giving to the poor. Part of the system of giving alms was something called an indulgence. An indulgence was an extension of giving alms where people could pay a certain amount and they could take off years of purgatory for themselves or for loved ones. 
even loved ones who had already passed. Connected to the idea of indulgences was the idea of relics. Relics were special items that served a similar purpose as indulgences, where people could pay to see a relic to get so many years off of their time in purgatory. And Rome had many of these relics. The bones of Peter and Paul, the skull of John the Baptist, the nail of a cross, the hair of the beard of one of the apostles were some of these relics. And Luther was excited to see these relics. He thought that in them, he would be able to have the forgiveness that he was seeking. So Luther is excited to make the pilgrimage and to visit the relics. However, when he arrived in Rome, he saw complete corruption in the church. Priests would rush through the mass to do five masses in the time that it should take to do one, not taking the importance of mass serious. He saw a clergy visiting brothels. He saw a complete lack of regard to the glory of God and the seriousness of the clergy calling. And during Luther's time in Rome, he visited the relics. And one of the most significant relics were the Holy Stairs. The Holy Stairs were the steps of Pontius Pilate and were therefore the very steps that Jesus walked up during his trial. These steps were moved and reassembled to Rome after the Crusades. And after climbing all 28 steps on his knees, saying the Our Father prayer on each step, Luther admits that he began to have doubt. When he reached the top, he stated out loud, to no one in particular, who knows if it is true. This records the first time that Luther had a bit of doubt in the whole system. While he was not yet ready to give it all up, in fact he would remain a devout monk for another decade, nonetheless a seed of doubt was planted and the Roman pilgrimage with all the relics did not help Luther feel any closer to God. In 1511, Shortly after returning to Erfurt from Rome, he was sent to Wittenberg, and this was at the request of a man named Frederick the Wise. Frederick the Wise was a prince of Saxony and was an elector, which was someone who was able to elect a new emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. I say that to simply explain that Frederick the Wise had some political power and political influence. At this time in world history, Frederick the Wise was seeking to put Wittenberg on the map. His plan was twofold. First, he began to collect as many relics as he could. He dreamed of people making pilgrimages to Wittenberg to view his relics. By 1518, Frederick had over 17,000 items, 17,000 relics. And if a person would pay to see them all, they would have earned near 2 million years off of their time in purgatory. The second part of Frederick's plan was that he wanted to create a university that could rival that even of Yerfurt's. To this end, he made a request of the church to send learned men to be professors at his university. Luther was one of the ones sent to meet this request. In 1512, Luther, age 28, earns his doctorate and becomes professor in Wittenberg. In 1513, Luther begins to teach through the Psalms. And then in 1515, around the age of 31, after spending two years teaching the Psalms, Luther would begin to teach Romans. So he began to study the Book of Romans to prepare his lectures. And this study would prove to be another life-changing event for Luther an event that is now referred to as the Tower Experience. While studying Romans, he read, for presumably the first time, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which states, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This text 
speaks about the righteousness of God, a topic that had plagued Luther and caused him into despair. But this time, as he read the text, he noticed something different about the righteousness of God. At first, he did not understand the text, but the more he studied, the more he began to realize that this text was speaking about how it is by faith that we are counted righteous. The righteousness in which we have is not our own. It is a righteousness that is apart from us. The righteousness that God calls us justified is not our own. It is the righteousness of Jesus applied to us through faith. When Luther realized this, he describes the relief that he felt in reading these words as like being born again. He had been a monk for ten years, and this was the first time that he had heard the gospel, and the gospel gave him new life. Luther would go on to read the rest of Romans, and eventually come across Romans chapter 3 verses 23 to, through 25, which states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, a truth that Luther knew all too well. But the text continues to say, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We are justified by God's grace as a gift, not by our merits. Our redemption is in Christ Jesus, not in ourselves. And we receive this justification by faith not our works. Notice that this text speaks directly to three of the solas. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola fide, through faith alone. Solus Christus, in Christ alone. These three solas speak to the gospel, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is this rediscovered truth, not having been taught by the church in a millennia, that impacted Luther and would drive him and the rest of his actions for the rest of his life. Now, to be clear, Luther did not immediately make all these connections. Not yet. Luther would not go on to articulate this theology for a few more years. But it is here where the seeds are planted. It is here where Luther for the first time felt the love of Christ. This is the power of the gospel. It changes lives. This caused Luther to seriously question penance, indulgences, and relics. But he was not yet ready to abandon the whole system. At least not yet. Two years go by. In the year 1517, a man named Johannes Tetzel is commissioned by the Archbishop of Brandenburg to sell indulgences throughout Saxony. There is a lot of intricate politics that is in play here that I'm not really going to get into, but the main thing to note is that the church was running low on funds due to extravagant spending, and the money made by these particular indulgences were going to go and fund the Grand Cathedral in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica, which would not only serve as the house to the bones of the apostles Peter and Paul, but would also serve as the papal headquarters. Johannes Tetzel was a charismatic indulgence seller who would travel around the region and he would use speechcraft and showmanship and play to people's emotions to persuade and guilt people to give their money. Listen to this sermon stated by Tetzel. Listen now, God and St. Peter call you. Consider the salvation of your souls and those of your loved ones departed, you priest, you noble, you merchant, you virgin, you matron, you youth, you old man, enter now into your church, which is the church of St. Peter. Visit the most holy cross erected before you and ever imploring you. Have you considered that you are lashed in a furious tempest amid the temptations and dangers of the world, and that you do not know whether you can reach the haven, not of your mortal body, but of your immortal soul? Consider that all who are contrite and have confessed and made contribution will receive complete remission of all their sins. Listen to the voices 
of your dear dead relatives and friends besieging you and saying, Pity us, pity us, we are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for pittance. Do you not wish to? Open your ears. Hear the father saying to his son, the mother to her daughter, We bore you, nourished you, brought you up, left you our fortunes, and you are so cruel and hard that now you are not willing for so little to set us free? Will you let us lie here in flames? Will you delay our promised glory? Remember that you are able to release them, for as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Will you not then, for a quarter of a florin, receive these letters of indulgences, through which you are able to lead a divine and immortal soul into the fatherland of praise? These were the kind of sermons that Johannes Tetzel would preach, and he had his little jingle, when a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And Luther was sickened by Tetzel's so-called sermons. Luther felt that Tetzel was strongly misrepresenting the sacrament of penance, which Tetzel was, and Luther felt Tetzel was making a mockery of God and was corrupt for the way he would manipulate people into buying indulgences. So, in response, Luther wrote up a few points of concern. On October 31st, 1517, Luther at the age of 33, almost 34, posted what is now called the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg church door. Now sometimes we like to get the image of Luther pounding these theses on the church door as a way of protest, but that was not it at all. First, let's clarify that nailing things on the church door was common at this time. The church door was commonly used as a bulletin board. Second, we should clarify that though Luther had his tower experience two years earlier, he was still a faithful Catholic monk who had no desire to protest. That wasn't even on his mind. His understanding of justification was still forming, he still believes in the sacraments of penance, and he still believes in purgatory. There is nothing in the 95 Theses about justification by faith alone. In fact, there is very little Protestant theology in the 95 Theses themselves. It was mainly 95 points against indulgences, and in particular, how they were being taught and sold by Tetzel. And third, it should be noted that Luther posted the 95 Theses because he was seeking a scholarly debate on the issue amongst his peers, and his peers alone. He was inviting his peers to discuss some of the issues that he saw in indulgences. In fact, Luther wrote the 95 Theses in Latin, which was the language of the scholars. The common citizen could not read Latin. This was clearly meant only for the scholars. But then two things happened that Luther did not expect. First, no one showed up to discuss the issue. And second, some of Luther's students read the 95 Theses, and without Luther's permission or his knowledge, these students translated the 95 Theses into German and then went to the newly invented printing press and had them published and distributed throughout Germany. It is said that within two weeks, every town, every city within Germany had a copy of these theses. The result of this mass production was a significant decrease in people buying indulgences. Now most theologians refer to the 95 Theses as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation Yet, I just explained, this was not an action of protest, and Luther did not even intend for anyone other than other scholars and theologians to read the document. That being said, I think it is accurate to say that it was the event that started the Reformation. The 95 Theses was like a bit of loose string on a sweater. And due to the Theses becoming so widely spread, it forced Luther and others to begin to pull at the string until the whole sweater unraveled. The nailing of the 95 Theses was the unintentional spark that lit the flames of the Protestant Reformation. Luther would go on instructing at the University of Wittenberg, 
and was now forced to really think through what he was teaching and the underlying significance of what the 95 Theses were all about. He eventually realized that it was really about the gospel itself. It's around this time that Luther begins to articulate that justification is by faith alone. In 1518, Luther is invited to address the issue with Cardinal Cajetan in Augsburg. The only problem was that this was not much of a debate. The Cardinal was not interested in scripture nor in debate, rather he simply was interested in Luther's obedience and for Luther to recant his words. And Luther did not recant and was dismissed. The following year, 1519, Luther debates Johannes Eck in Leipzig. Eck was a well-educated and a great speaker and particularly knowledgeable of church councils and church history. And Eck pointed out to Luther that what Luther was saying went against the ruling of previous popes and the church councils. This forced Luther to declare that scripture had to have authority over the pope and the church councils. During this debate, Luther would say things like the Pope and councils could err, and they had erred before, as they were human. He would make the statements like, Scripture alone was the authority, as Scripture alone is from God. He maintained his stance that justification was by faith alone because that is what was taught in Scripture, and that the Pope and church councils must be wrong since their ruling was counter to Scripture. Eck then pointed out that John Huss made a very similar statement and was burned at the stake for it. Eck went on to call out Luther as a new John Huss. Now these statements should have condemned Luther as a heretic then and there. He should have been brought to burn at the stake for these comments, and indeed many were saying as much. But Luther had something that John Huss did not have, which was political friends. The Holy Roman Emperor had just died, which meant that the electors would need to vote for a new emperor. Since Frederick the Wise was one of the few who had the authority to vote, the Pope wanted to remain in good graces with Frederick and therefore did not go after his monk. At least not yet. And so Luther was saved in part due to an election. And in 1519, Charles V, who was already King of Spain, would become the new Holy Roman Emperor. In 1520, Luther published many works, and three significant works were first, to the Christian nobility of the German nation, which was a bit of a call of nationalism, and called the princes of Germany to use their political authority to reform the church. This call of nationalism ended up persuading many German princes to Luther's side, not so much for theological reasons, but political. A second major book that Luther published in this year was The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, which is about how Rome has become like the new Babylon and is holding the church in captivity. Now we have a Luther that was much more in protest of Rome, calling out the corruption that he sees and the errors of their theology. In this book, Luther explains that there are not seven sacraments as the church had taught, but only two. This was a significant departure from the clear teaching of the Catholic Church. A third significant book that Luther published in this year was The Freedom of a Christian. And this book was about how those in Christ are freed from the law, yet those in Christ will still love God and love their neighbor. In this book, Luther expands on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Well, it wouldn't be too long before the Pope re-noticed Luther, and near the end of 1520, Luther was summoned to the Pope on the accusations of heresy. Luther was given 60 days to arrive in Rome and to recant his teachings, but Luther does not go to Rome. In response, Luther burns the Pope's summons and in 1521, the Pope excommunicates Martin Luther and condemns him as a heretic and appeals to the newly elected Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And so Luther is summoned to the city of Worms to be tried by Emperor Charles V 
with a promise of safe passage. Now keep in mind, John Huss in his time also had that promise, which was not honored. And this is a summon that Luther simply could not ignore. And while many of his friends told him not to go, Luther went full well expecting that he would likely be burned to the stake, just as John Huss was before him. And so, in 1521, Luther is tried in Worms, and during the trial, Luther is asked two questions. The first question that they asked Luther was, Are these your works? Referring to a pile of books and pamphlets on the table, which indeed were his works. The second question was, Do you recant of all the teachings in these works? Well, Luther affirmed that they were his, yet he did not recant. Rather, he sought to debate the issue. But the court was not interested in debate. Instead, they demanded a simple answer, yes or no. And to this, Luther asked for 24 hours to think it over, which was granted. That night, he prayed that he would have the strength not to cave in, to hold to what he knew to be true, but he was also conflicted, wondering if he was wrong. The question that he sincerely asked himself, which was asked of him in the trial, am I alone right? He asked himself, who am I to question the wisdom of the church councils? Could I be so arrogant to say that I am right and all of them are wrong? But then he realized he was not the one determining what was true. To that, he appealed to scripture, and scripture clearly taught a person is saved apart from works, a person justified by faith alone. And so, the next day, Luther replies by stating the following, Since then, your serene majesties and your lordships seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner plain and unvarnished. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or clear reason, for I do not trust in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they often err and contradict themselves, I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. Do you see that in this speech, Luther is essentially teaching the five solas? He said, I will not recant that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For this is the teaching of scripture, and scripture alone is the authority of truth. I submit myself, therefore, to God and His glory, for God alone is worthy of all glory. This is what the Reformation is all about. A faithful teaching of the gospel, that Jesus came to die for our sins. Jesus offers us a salvation as a free gift out of His grace. We do not need to do anything to earn salvation. There is nothing that we can do to earn it. Rather, we receive salvation through our faith in Christ. This is the clear teaching of Scripture, which is our highest authority of truth, as Scripture are the very words of God. Consider these words from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, which states, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is the truth that Martin Luther rediscovered and proclaimed to the world. This is the truth that Luther was willing to die for. The funny thing is, Luther did not die that day. After giving that speech, he was let go. Luther would go on to live another 25 years and continue to lead the Reformation and will continue to preach the gospel. At this point, I would like to pause and consider one of the words of John Huss. 
R.C. Sproul notes that there is a double irony with Luther and John Huss. The first has to do with one of John Huss's final words before being executed. Now to understand Huss's words properly, let me first explain that John Huss's last name, Huss, can be translated as the word goose. And so, one of Huss's last recorded words before being burned at the stake were, Today you will roast a lean goose, but a hundred years from now you'll hear a swan sing, whom you will leave unroasted, and no trap or net will catch him for you. These words were spoken in the year 1415, about a hundred years before Luther nailed the 95 Theses. Luther, and many others, came to see himself as the swan that John Huss spoke of, as he was never captured by the Catholic Church. Now, as I said, there was a double irony here. The first is in the amazing prediction that someone would come in a hundred years that the church would not burn. The second is that the bishop who oversaw Huss's execution was eventually buried in the tombs in Erfurt. Now you may recall from earlier in this session that Luther himself first entered and became ordained in Erfurt. During Luther's ordination, he would have laid on the floor with his arms outstretched in the form of a cross, as was part of the ordination ceremony. In his book, Willing to Believe, R.C. Sproul notes that the exact spot where Luther lay was marked by an inscription in the stone indicating who was buried directly beneath that spot, the very bishop who had ordered the execution of John Huss. It is a great temptation to revise history and ascribe to the bishop an appropriate response to Huss's words that a swan would come. I would like to think that the bishop replied, Over my dead body. Indeed, it was over his dead body, that the swan was ordained. But what made Luther different? Again, Luther has Prince Frederick the Wise to thank, who protected him. Shortly after leaving his trial in Worms, Luther was captured, but captured by Frederick men, which made it look like Luther had been attacked. They looked like they were robbers, but in reality, they took Luther and hid him away in the Wartburg Castle for safekeeping. And Luther would spend about a year there, and during that time, he translated the New Testament into German. And before long, there was a German Bible all throughout Germany. This would inspire others like William Tyndale to translate the Bible in the language of their countries. While Wycliffe was the first to do it, Wycliffe did not have the printing press. This was a tool that Luther, Tyndale, and others used to ensure that all people could read the Bible. After about a year, Luther left his exile and continued to lead the Reformation in Wittenberg under the protection of Frederick. Since Luther was condemned, he was limited where he could travel and spent nearly the rest of his life in Wittenberg. Remarkably, the German princes eventually stood up to the emperor and the emperor backed down. This essentially legalized Lutherism for a time. Luther eventually married to Katharina von Bora, who herself was an ex-nun, and then together they had six kids. Luther would go on to write many more books and songs, lead and influence others to reform the church, and then, in February 1546, while visiting Eisleben, Luther died of an illness at the age of 62. As I close, I would like to share words that R.C. Sproul recorded for the opening of his music CD, which he produced called Glory to the Holy One. In this opening, Sproul beautifully summarizes the work and importance of Martin Luther and the Reformation.
one hammer in the hand of an obscure Augustinian monk changed the world forever. Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg, Germany, calling his fellow professors to examine issues of supreme theological importance. Thus began the Reformation, through which the light of God's Word was brought out of the darkness to shine with clarity once more. One of the central cries of the Protestant Reformation was this, the just shall live by faith. Luther's development of the doctrine of justification by faith alone recovered the gospel that had been hidden during the Middle Ages. And at the center of that gospel is the affirmation that the righteousness by which we are declared just before a holy God is not our own. It's a foreign righteousness, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that Luther said is extra nos, apart from us. Namely, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That righteousness that is imputed or counted for all who put their trust in Him. Because of that affirmation, Luther was involved in serious controversies, controversies that culminated in his being brought to trial before the princes of the church and even before the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. And there at the Diet of Worms summoned in Germany, Luther was called upon to recant his views. He answered his interlocutors by saying, Revoco? You want me to say, Revoco? That I recant? I will not recant unless I'm convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason. I cannot recant, for my conscience is held captive by the word of God. And to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. In every generation, the gospel must be published anew with the same boldness and the same clarity and the same urgency that came forth in the 16th century Reformation. The church has always done this in both the spoken word and in song, producing hymns that tell us of the great salvation that has been wrought by God alone through Christ alone. These hymns that you hear today are sacred music for the church, giving glory to the Holy One.